morning, so welcome everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I want to introduce you to Barbie, and in 1959, Barbie was launched to the world. Now, she was pretty groundbreaking. She was the world's first affordable, mass-produced doll for young girls, and she was an adult doll with accessories. And she came at a time in America where they were pretty buoyant um, after the Second World War, and middle-class suburban families had quite a bit of disposable cash, Children and teenagers were a new consumer market, and TV a new advertising medium. And what Barbie did was she gave these young girls hope for a different future. So instead of playing with paper dolls or baby dolls, they gave her a future beyond motherhood and domesticity. Because with Barbie, these girls could enact their future. They could dress her up in the latest fashion trends, they could have her go to parties or drive a car or go skiing or swimming, and importantly, she could have a career. But in 1967, they launched a new aversion because Barbie couldn't actually work. She couldn't move very well, so they gave her bendy knees and elbows and a swivel waist. And they did something that was quite unique. They asked the consumers, in order to boost sales, to trade in their Barbie dolls. And this really welcomed in a new era. Unknowingly, what Mattel was doing was they were creating, um, they, were, they were helping their, the new consumers to understand the value of temporary and a society that was valuing transience. So no longer did things need to be built to last, they could be replaced. So girls didn't need to look after their dolls and save them like their mothers, they could just perish. So the idea that we can have something that is fine and it can be replaced is now so inbuilt into our cultures that few of us actually stop to think about it. And sustainable development, this term was actually first used in 1987. And what it means is it's the idea that societies must live and meet their needs um, without compromising the ability of future generations to, to meet theirs. And it's key for every single industry now. Industry. And this is where we are. So we need to get rid of that throwaway culture that we've been living with ever since the 1950s. If we think of our planet right now, we have used up a third of the world's natural resources in the last 30 years. The last time we lived beyond, uh, within our means was actually December 29th, 1970. We have a situation at the moment where by 2025, 1.8 billion people in the world are going to be without drinking water. If we don't change our ways in the next 25 years, we will have got rid of all of our fish that we eat. In the next 27 years, we will have run out of food if we don't change our ways. And right now, what we need, we need 1.7 planets in order to sustain us. So that's in terms of what we're consuming and also our waste. Now, cybersecurity is absolutely fundamental to sustainable development and protecting our world. And I want to welcome you to, to day two. Uh, that's what I asked. Uh, my name is Jane Franklin, and I am a leader, I'm an author, and I am a women's change agent. And I'm going to be covering these things. I'm going to be covering where the future of cyber is going, uh, the main challenges the industry needs to overcome if it's to support, support sustainability, a sustainable planet, what we really need to do in terms of our people, process, and technology, and really how cybersecurity can contribute to a more sustainable world. So if we think about what's happened since the 1950s, that's three workplace generations, we can see that we have been steadily digitalizing our assets and actually adapting to new technologies. And thanks to things like Moore's Law, we've been increasing in, in speed. But nothing could have prepared us for the global pandemic in 2020, because that just changed everything. And literally, some people think that we advanced in terms of our digital transformation three to five years within the first few months. And we've been on overdrive ever since. 
So we have been investing in cloud-first strategies in data management and data integration and, thankfully, cybersecurity. But work is speeding up and automating faster than anyone could have imagined. And the World Economic Forum have actually said that by the end of this year, thanks to automated technologies, so that's things like AI and machine learning, that we will be displacing 75 million jobs and increasing, uh, we're going to be building, creating another 133 million jobs. So as we have this overhaul happening, we are actually going to need 54% of our world's population to upskill and, and reskill. So that's, that's all going on, and a lot of people are really excited about, about that, and that's quite right too. But as we change the way that we are working, as we create new skills and requirements and these higher value tasks for all of us to do, then in cybersecurity, we're getting quite nervous because we don't really like change. It just introduces new risks. And what we are seeing is a mounting attack surface at the same time as uh, uh, not enough skills for, for us to, to use to protect our environments. So right now, we have 5 billion people online. We have 14.4 billion connected devices. We have more and more data that we are creating and storing and processing. In fact, if you were to put all of that data, the zettabytes of data, onto a DVD drive and stack it all up, it would go around the Earth 222 times. We're now working remotely and in a hybrid manner. We are working globally. We're working with different time zones. We are on the move as, as well. We are working from our homes, from cafes, from airport lounges and hotel rooms. And we are working with numerous um, teams simultaneously. And we're context switching about every 30 minutes. And we're having to learn and unlearn new tools and new approaches. And the amount of brain power that is being asked of us right now is immense. You know, it is absolutely no wonder why we are really um, struggling when it comes to cybersecurity tax and compliance failures. The situation where we're in right now in 2022 is you can hire a hacker on the dark web for 250 US dollars per job. You can, hire, you can um, subscribe to a ransomware SaaS kit for $40 per, per month. Malware variants are growing by about 45%. Uh, we're discovering about 1,500 new variants per day. Atta our attacks are up. Credential theft is the highest form of attack, followed by phishing, um, uh, misconfigured cloud, and vulnerabilities in third-party data. And the data breach lifecycle is roughly about 11 months for credential theft, about 10 months for misconfigured, uh, for phishing rather, and about eight months for misconfigured cloud. Our ransomware attacks are actually lower than last year, but the amount of ransoms that are being asked for are increasing. So when Caseo was attacked um, this year, their attackers asked for 70 million US dollars. And likewise, when Accenture were attacked, their attackers asked for 50 million US dollars. They weren't paid, but ransoms are being paid, and the highest one to date has actually been 40 million dollars, and that was in 2021. But it's not all bad news. I'm smiling when I say that, because we are evolving, and it really makes me so happy to, to uh, be able to tell you that. And we're evolving when we're using hybrid cloud, and we're using automated technologies, and when we have uh, when we're using zero trust approaches, and when we have incident response plans in place that are very well rehearsed and well resourced security teams. So all that's good. But we actually need to do more because the business models of the future are upon us now, and they are very different to how they were in the past. Because ironically, they're actually rooted, when we have a depleting world and resources, these are actually rooted in abundance and a non-zero-sum game. So in other words, there is a lot, there is enough for everybody, 
and, and um, everybody can win. And the more a person or organization develops themselves and contributes that to the whole, whether that's the organization or the community, the better we all do. However, cybersecurity has a paradox to contend with, and it's this. The greater the security, the less useful the thing being secured will be. And businesses right now would actually have to increase their, their um, budgets ninefold in order to secure 95% of the threats that are out there. There is no such thing as 100% security because everything is hackable. So we really need to be changing the conversation from securing to actually cyber resilience. And we need to be talking about how we're managing risk and also trust. And this is a hard concept for budget holders to understand, particularly chief finance officers. So when we look at sustainability and security, we really have to be mapping security's main pillars of people, process, and technology onto sustainability's three main pillars of social, economic, and environmental. In other words, um, people, profits, and, and planet. And we have to look at trust because we are failing in our foundations. We live in a world of, of fakeness, of misinformation, of bias, and also um, constant filtering. And right now, algorithms are out there, um, search engine algorithms, software, uh, uh, social media platform algorithms, and they are making decisions on what we want to access, what we want to consume, what information we want to find, what we want to buy, and who we want to connect with. And this is only going to in increase. And we are able, we have images and videos and sound that can all be doctored. We can doctor those ourselves if you want to look more perfect, and often we're encouraged to, to do that. Or we can use those if you want to be playful and entertain. And of course, our bad actors can, can use them if they want to steal or manipulate us. And all of, this is, all of this data is being lumped in together. And it is really hard for us to actually ascertain what is true and what is not. And it's so easy for us to blur the lines between fact, misinformation, and opinion. But restoring trust is absolutely necessary. And it's not about eliminating risk, because we can't do that. But it is about understanding our risks better and about prioritizing them and managing them. And the good news is, is that we are actually pretty good at managing risk. We've been doing this for forever. And we've been guided from the moment we were born by our parents, our families, our schools, and educators, all the way through to our, our laws. And, um, and so that's kind of where, where we are now. So right now, when we are looking at, at all of this, it's imperative that security is, is involved in it, because without it, we run the risk of more division, which I think is where we are now. Because if we're looking at the political landscape, it's incredibly polarized wherever you are in the world. And We've got the division which will lead to conflict, which will lead to wars, which will lead to anarchy, which will lead to the destruction of our planet. So cybersecurity is essential for, for all of this. And when we are looking at trust, we don't have to be perfect with it. It doesn't require perfection, but it does require honesty. It requires accountability, and it requires transparent, inclusive communication. And so when we're looking at our job as cybersecurity practitioners, in terms of assuring the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of, of our digital world, and how we can reduce waste and lower costs and maximize production and innovation, then we have to really look at our cyber risk literacy. We have to get that into, and we have to get it to our citizens of the world. And that means getting it into our schools, into our communities. And often our communities are forgotten about, particularly one set of, of people, our older people, and obviously into our workforces. Because when we can help everyone to really understand what is a fake website, what, what is untrue, and what is a deep fake, 
and how they can better protect themselves so they're not falling for, for scams, then the less we are misled and the less we are actually leaning on our environment in terms of sustainability, so the less resources that we are, we are using. Okay, so when it comes to managing risk, what we really need to be doing is unleashing opportunity and this rapid adoption of innovative technologies. And when we do that, we have to be pairing humans and machines together because we've only got four million people in cybersecurity and with the world's population growing, we can't do it alone. Humans are absolutely brilliant at communication, at empathy, at creativity, at finding things and asking questions and investigating. And they're not so good at number crunching, analyzing big data sets, and sometimes following rules and orders, but machines are, they're really good. But people can be manipulated. They can be manipulated by emotions. And they can suffer from a lack of sleep or stress or um, overwhelm and burnout. And they can make bad de decisions when that happens. Machines, too, can be manipulated. And they can, be, they can break. They can be hacked. And they can be coded with biased data. And probably the best example of, or an example I want to share with you today about coded data, or bias coded data, is a machine learning algorithm that was produced by Amazon. And this ran for five years. And what Amazon did, um, it ran for five years before they actually noticed that it was coded biased. But what they did was they wanted to actually find a pattern for success. So what constituted a really successful employee? And so they went through 10 years' worth of, of data, successful candidates from Amazon, who happened to be men. And that's just it happened to be because it was a male-dominated environment. But unaware of this, what the algorithm started to do was find patterns. And whenever anyone applied, if they weren't a man, which was the number one success factor, they eliminated them, or they went to the, the, the lowest, uh, the bottom of the pile. So it was coded biased against women, not intentionally, but that's what happens. And that's why I have this slide up here, because we have to have, it's not enough to have humans and machines, we have to have diverse teams. Because when we have diverse teams, we actually um, do better. We make better decisions 87% of the time when that happens. And we are two times faster as well. We have half the meetings, again, so we're not using more resources than we need, and we're getting work done faster, being more productive. And innovation equals survival with the fourth industrial revolution, which is where we are today. And so when companies have cultures that are more equal, they are six times more innovative than the less equal ones. So that's what we need. And when we think about our attackers and how they are progressing and how they are becoming more collaborative and business-like in their approaches and how they're using all of this automated technology to their adv advantage, then we really need to be using these corkscrew thinking skills and, um, and breaking the muscle memory of knowledge hoarding that we have in cyber and we need to be collaborating more and doing things in a different way. And one of the things that we can also do is we can use women. We can lean on women. We have to get women into our organizations and create more parity there. Because women in business are good for business. There have been lots of studies that, that show this. They're good for productivity, profits, innovation, and companies stay on budget um, and on track much more than compared to homogenous teams. And when we have diverse leadership, uh, they are, diverse leaders have been proven to actually equip teams with the skills necessary for disruptive trends that are occurring and transforming our, our industries. So that has to happen. But when we look at security, this is what really excites me, because women do see risk in a different way to men. Women are really good at assessing odds, and they are really good at... Um, and at, at looking at data and spotting things that aren't necessarily um, normal. 
And that's what we need, this behavioral analysis, because that's a skill that's required in cyber. So protecting our environments and, and spotting bad actors and attack techniques. Women are also highly emotional, they're intuitive, and they score highly on social and emotional intelligence. And they are really good at adopting rules and controls and regulations and techno technology is much more so, and I'm saying this typically compared to um, men. But it's not that one gender is better than the other, but what it is is that when we come together as human beings, all people, we do better. And what I want to show you here is something from the World Economic Forum, and it's the global risk perceptions, because I find this interesting. So whilst I could stand here and say, yes, there are hundreds of reports that look at women and how they see risk in a different way to men, and I can cite at least four from, from cyber, I want to show you this, because this is the World Economic Forum. It's a naught to two years view from experts, and they have been tracking gender for years and years and years. And you can see the disparity or the difference between how men and women are seeing risk. So if we look at people, then anyone who cares about sustainable development, uh, let's do that, okay. Um, if we look at people, anyone who cares about sustainability is going to invest in their people because they know that people are the front line of sustainability. And what that means is they are going to de-bias their hiring methods. They are going to invest in their leaders so that their leaders develop skills that are required for high performance and a high uh, psychological safe environment. They understand the cost to redo work. They understand that there is a war on talent right now with over 60% of hiring managers in cyber struggling to hire and with over 52% struggling to retain talent. So they understand the impacts of what that has on their teams when their teams are depleted. They become stressed, they can't do the work, it's not possible. And, and so they, they work really, really hard at that. Um, they also understand that absences cost organizations 150 billion US dollars per year, but presenteeism, when people just show up and don't necessarily do good quality work, actually costs 10 times that amount. So again, work that needs to be re redone or is poor quality is more costly and it's not good for our environment. But when we look at process, if you could reduce the amount of software vulnerabilities by 50%, if you could reduce the, um, the, the costs of security management and incident response by 75%, the question is, would you? Now, if you ask any cybersecurity leader, they're going to say yes, um, pretty much all of the time, if not all of the time. But if you were to ask a business leader or a, another technology leader, they may say it depends. So, it, and that, that's the right thing to, to say. Because if speed is the success factor for that technology or that service, then it, security is gonna be, need to be considered after go live. But when it's not, you've got to ask yourself, why are more leaders not actually adopting secure practices and processes earlier on? You know, why are they building and deploying and retiring te technologies without including security and thinking about sustainability? So we have to get this built into our organizations. We have to be more collaborative with our, our approaches. We have to get out to all of the stakeholders. We have to include internal audit and cybersecurity right at the requirement stage. And we need to involve them all the way through from the design, the verification, the, um, the design, the implementation, the verification, the support, maintenance, and end of life phases. We need to make sure that we are, we are um, we are accessible, information is accessible, and it is understood, because when that happens, we do better, and we use less of the Earth's resources. And we also need to come together collectively, actually. We need to make sure that we're not redoing work. So when we are creating these bodies of knowledge, or these councils, all laws and regulations, we need to simplify those, and we need to make sure that we are not duplicating, because it's so 
uh, wasteful. I see this an awful lot, and it's, it's so time-consuming. Then, of course, when we look at technologies, then <clears throat> if we are considering digital transformation, we know that any organization that invests in digital transformation does so because it wants to beat the competition. It wants to seize market share or maintain it. And it also wants to be more cost-effective. It wants to do things more intelligently. It wants to add value. It wants to solve problems. And security is integral to this. It can't do that without security at all. So when we're looking at technologies, we really can replace a lot of old technologies, a lot of legacy systems, uh, and replace them with greener technologies and reduce the IT burden, that, that management. We can um, look at slow backhauls uh, through data centers and latency causing security controls. They can be removed, which can increase our, our productivity. And we can look at new approaches. I mentioned zero trust approach a few minutes ago, but we can also look at SASE and we can look at the zero, trust, uh, zero mesh architecture. Uh, because certainly when we look at the latter, Gartner have said that that can reduce the financial burden of, of a security impact by a, an average of, of 90%. So again, less wasteful. And then we can re-architecture our environments. We can remove costly private networks. We can look at single point solutions and just be more uh, aware and less wasteful. And then when we're working remotely from anywhere in the world, we can be buying more smartly. We can be buying devices that don't need to be shipped back to us, that can be fixed wherever they are. And, and that's good because what that means is it's not, there's not a burden on fossil fuel emissions or um, greenhouse gases and air pollution, and we have lower plastic waste and, and paper waste. And of course, these devices are improving. They have machine learning and security uh, built into them, so they can spot attacks, and we can do better. So the future of humanity and all life on Earth really does depend on us as a collective. Sustainable development is the peace policy of the future, and cybersecurity is essential. It cannot do that without us. I want to thank you for listening to me today.